a last presentation, uh, hopefully slightly shorter. So we will have, um, there will be time for more questions and feel free in the, in the next Q and A to, uh, uh, to um, ask questions uh, uh, related to all of the presentations, to the whole theme, not just to this, uh, to this last one. So let me say something about uh, singleness, celibacy, and marriage, and, and uh, something about our thinking as Christians here. Recently in Sweden, there was a huge debate in secular media around an essay written in one of the, the, the um, uh, biggest um, newspapers in Sweden. And it was a, a young uh, woman who wrote it. She wrote about dating and the frustration she uh, has felt in terms of the dating scene. And he coined, she coined the phrase, there may be man, there may be man. And uh, here's what, uh, what she said. She described different men she dated and their different attitudes. And then she said, the most common variety is there may be man. Those who take advantage, but then wash their hands. I have encountered these men so many times. The intimidated men who do not want to make any promises, but also do not have the care or the courage or the decency enough to withdraw and actually say a clear no. There may be men seem to be everywhere. I've had so many similar conversations about them all my life with different women. Conversations over coffee, over wine, over messenger, during angry walks. We have asked ourselves why they are the way they are, why they are silent, do not answer text messages, get cold feet, shut us out. So here's a new thing happening in our secular culture. There may be man. Here's another, uh, there was a question about what's, uh, why has uh, men been the winner of the sexual revolution and uh, women more uh, have lost more? Well, here is one, one aspect. Men want sex from women, but they are not that keen or committing themselves and saying no to all, to all other women. So we have this maybe men who happily would date women and happily would have sex with them, but they're not ready to commit. In the long term, in the long run, both men and women are suffering here, are losing out on the richness of life by this attitude. Uh, but in, in a certain way, women uh, even more than uh, men, I would say. <clears throat> In the New Testament and from uh, in, in a Christian perspective, there is really only two categories. If you study the teaching of Jesus and you study the teaching of Paul, there are only two categories. That is, you can be married, one man and one woman, even though there is a lot of polygamy in the Old Testament. That is not a sign of it being blessed by God, not at all. Uh, polygamy is a deviation from God's will. It's an expression of uh, men's sinf sinfulness. And if you study all the passages of polygamy's marriages in the Old Testament, you will see that none of them are happy. All of them are disastrous. All of them are destructive. So you don't, uh, you actually don't need God to say, uh, polygamy is wrong. You can just see how it's described. And the starting point, of course, in the Bible is monogamous marriage, one man and one woman. And the other alternative is the calling to live uh, as a single, a celibate life, which according to the New Testament gives new, give new opportunities to live for the Lord, to live for his kingdom, to serve a, a larger amount of people 
than you can when you live in a marriage where your um, where a lot of your attention and focus will be on a few persons, your wife and your own children, and, and that immediate context. So from a Christian perspective, we have those two categories. We don't, uh, we don't have maybe men who, uh, uh, who have sex but do not commit, but we have married people and we have single people. And if you're a Christian single people who then have new opportunities to serve. <clears throat> now, for life in a fallen world, we, we need to be honest here. Both marriage and single lives, uh, to uh, live a single life is, is a calling from God. But that does not mean it is an easy calling or always some, something that is uh, the natural fit for who you are as a person. That is part of life in a fallen world. We find ourselves in many non-ideal circumstances, but where we still have to carry on with our lives and believe in the Lord and serve people in the circumstances we are. And this means that a number of Christians will find themselves in marriages that are far from ideal, where there are struggles and disappointments, but where the calling is to overcome them those struggles um, and fight for the marriage. And other will find themselves uh, living a single life, even though that is not what they longed for, or even if that is not something that is ideally in terms of who they are as a person. But that is part of the, of, of the fallen, uh, life in a fallen world. We find ourselves in situations that are not ideal. We can think of uh, Europe after the war, where so many men had died in the war and so many women who longed for marriage and would have been excellent wives couldn't go into that calling but have to serve the Lord and serve other people in a calling as a single. Or we think of China now where so many men will not be able to find a wife because of a horrible family policy, for, uh, policy from the Chinese government. And where, of course, we should do what we can to change circumstances. We are not uh, determinists that just bow for every circumstance. Uh, not at all. We should pray to God. We should do what we can. And still, we will find ourselves in circumstances that are not ideal. And then we need to follow the Lord and serve the Lord and uh, take, up, take on our cross uh, and live in a non-ideal situation. That is some, sometimes the calling. Now, Christians often ask the question, what, which is the better calling? To live in marriage or to live as a single? I have uh, uh, been teaching a lot of students during the year, uh, students coming from a Christian background. And I found it very interesting to notice which verses in the Bible that uh, are stuck in people's minds. Generally, it's too few Bible verses these days. So that's a, uh, uh, that's a problematic situation. But those verses that have stuck in the mind that people can quote by heart is sometimes really surprising, is not always the central verses about the gospel, about who God is, what he has done for us in Jesus Christ, about the hope we have, about the salvation. No, it's some other verses that people have big hangups over. And one verse that so many people can uh, refer to, it's a place in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, where Paul seems to be saying it's better to, uh, it's better not to marry. 
So then the question is, is it is life as a celibate single to be preferred for the Christian? Is that the higher calling? Is it less spiritual uh, to live in marriage and to have a family and to focus so much energy and time on that few people? Uh, even if you have a big family, it's still uh, numerically rather few uh, persons. So how should we think? Well, this verse has been behind some of the ascetic tendency within the, the church history. And you think of the monasteries and the calling to live a celibate life as a, um, as a monk or a nun, or that, um, uh, uh, that it's preferable that uh, priests should be, uh, should be not, should uh, not be married. It goes back to an interpretation of these verse. So a, a, a thinking that it's higher spiritually to not be married, not expressing yourself sexually. But that is the wrong understanding of this passage. And if we had a time, we could go through 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul is answering a lot of practical questions about married life, and single life and how to think. And this quote is from that discussion. But that quote needs to be seen in the broader context of the whole chapter and of course of, of the whole biblical, uh, biblical teaching. And Paul has to, uh, uh, to relate to, to several different uh, positions that he knows is in the church in Corinth. Some people with a, with a strong Jewish background, they would take it just for granted that everyone should be married. It's a strong aspect of the Jewish culture. Of course, there were a few individuals who were not married, like the prophet Elijah or John the Baptist. But generally, you should marry and you should help to fulfill the earth. Uh, that was the Jewish uh, uh, thinking. So celibate life did not, it was not really a... a really an option. But then in Corinth, there were some people looking at all the hedon hedonism uh, around, going around in the culture and they say, whoa, sex, sex is not good. It cannot be spiritual to live out your sexuality, not even within marriage. Uh, and therefore they wanted to, to stop sexual expression maybe even within marriage. So Paul has to deal with those different uh, uh, opinions. And to quote Craig Blomberg, he says, when he's commenting on this passage, the genius of Paul's reply to the Corinthians is the, that he avoids the extremes of asceticism, says no to sexuality in marriage, and hedonism, and he refuses to prize too highly either single or married life. So we should not ask, which is the better way? That is dependent upon the person and the situation and the context. There is not on a principle level, a better way. But according to the New Testament perspective here, we should think like this. Sex is a good thing. It's given to us by God, but it's not the ultimate. And sex is not what the, is not what will define your life if you have expressed yourself sexually or not. Sex is not ultimate. You will not find a meaning of life in sex. It's not what will define you. You need to find your definition in something other than sex, even though you should affirm that sex is good. So ultimately, you should be defined by God and what he has done to you in Jesus Christ. And you should be defined uh, in your relationship with Christ. Out from that definition, you could say that marriage is good and within marriage, sex is good. And that is one possible calling that you can have. And secondly, singleness is good. 
And celibacy is a good thing because it frees you up in a way that marriage and sex does not. So this will be a question of your individual calling, of the way God calls you, uh, the way God calls you to walk. And you cannot say which way is the better one. It's dependent on God's calling for you and the situation you are uh, in the context of your life. So we have different callings, but with a common goal to glorify God and to work for uh, to glorify God, to love people and to work for his kingdom. And that goal can be fulfilled both in a married life and in a, in a life as a single. Now, many churches have a lot of focus on families and on Sunday school and youth work and, and on marriage counseling and so on. And that's good, it's, it's needed. But we need to also to do much, much more for people who have to find themselves in a life where they are singles and who have a calling at the moment to live as a single person. And we need, especially I think, to help each other, to challenge each other uh, in how we use our marriages if we are married and our homes, regardless of we are, if we are married or single. We as Christians do not believe in open marriages, of course not, but we do believe in open homes. And here I think in the church and for the Christian families, we need to do much more to open up uh, our homes and, and, and create wider communities uh, and not having this closed nuclear family. So the Bible have a high view of marriage, but it, it has not a restricted view of the nuclear family of father, mother, children, and no one else being related to them. That's a modern idea. A, a, a marriage should be a hub for many different forms of relationships, of course, non-sexual, of course, but of relationships and warmth and community of, uh, of many different sorts. <clears throat> Let me end this by, uh, by some uh, concluding remarks. What I've presented here in those different presentations is, <clears throat> uh, is really not in line with mainstream culture. So it is, a, it, it is a position that is markedly different and it can make a Christian feeling odd. I hope you have felt that even if you are culturally odd, this is a position that still is in, in relationship to reality. It relates to who we are as human beings. It relates not only to the Bible as the word of God, but it relates to this world as the creation of God. But still culturally, we are on the side and we are under a lot of pressure. And then we need to remind ourselves that it was the same thing for the first Christians for many generations, for several centuries. But gradually, because the Christians did not succumb, did not bow down before the emperor and before the cultural pressures in terms of sexuality, some amazing things happened. In the book, From Shame to Sin, The Christian Transformation of Sexual Morality in Late, late Antiquity, it, uh, Harper Kyle gives this, Kyle Harper says this, the most astonishing development of late antiquity is the transformation of radical sexual ide ideology. For centuries, the possession of a small strident band of vociferous dissenters into a culture, a broadly shared public framework of values and meanings. So you have this small group with a radical sexual ideology gradually transforming the culture. How did that happen? Well, there are many reasons, but one of them was this. In the early centuries of the Christian le in the early centuries, the Christian leadership spoke in an apologetic key. This fact shaped the entire tonal arrangement 
of early Christian moralizing. Here are things to be learned. <clears throat> I've criticized some of the church fathers for having a wrong view on sexuality. So let me give you uh, two good quotes from the church father. Uh, St. Anthony the Great, he has said, the time is coming when men will go mad and when they see someone who is not mad, they will attack him saying, you're mad, you're not like us. A lot of people are saying, we are mad. But that raises the whole question. Who actually is made mad? What is the definition of madness here? And Chrysostomo, he has said, we, we must not mind insulting men if by respecting them, we offend God. So we need to be humble and respectful. We need to learn to love people, but we also need to have the courage to stand up for conviction, for truth, for goodness. And we must not mind insulting our secular culture. If we are in a situation where respecting the culture would ultimately be to offend God. That is a um, important challenge for the Christian church of today. Okay, my time is gone. Uh, and we open up for some moments of questions. Okay, let's dive right in. Our first question here is, what about the desire for gender change? Is it appropriate to pursue this and therefore be able to follow God's intention for a heterosexual covenantal marriage relationship? So this is the most, uh, <clears throat> uh, the most recent development uh, coming from the sexual uh, revolution to, uh, uh, to try to change your, your gender by ch changing uh, actually your body. And the whole question here is what should have priority? The objective fact of your body, a perfectly healthy human body, male or female, or your inner being, which feels that you are the opposite sex of, of your body. Historically, uh, both Christians and non-Christians have said, because it's, it's not altogether a new phenomenon, historically people have said, well, in this situation, the objective fact of the body should have priority over your inner experience of who you are. And therefore we should work with your inner being to help it to come more in line with what your body already is. Now, in our very um, subjective and uh, individual, individualistic time, we have instead turned that upside down. So we say, okay, it is the inner being who's, who has priority. It's your feeling of who you are that we need to take seriously. And therefore, we should be prepared to, to change your body. Now, I think that, um, I think that is the the wrong way to go. I'm not denying that some people are in horrible pain here and needs to be taken seriously, uh, but that does not mean that we should give priority to the inner experience of who you are. <clears throat> okay. okay, thank you. Um, our next question is, how do you respond to the objection that it is unfair and even unrealistic to demand that all those with a homosexual orientation must live celibate lives in order to please God? Mm. Uh, thank you for raising that. That of course put into sharp focus the, 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 uh, the, the painful uh, aspect of uh, 
of the biblical position, painful for an individual, challenging for an individual. Uh, firstly, let me say I'm, uh, I'm not uh, claiming that we should force anyone, uh, not legally that we should have a, a judicial system that forbids people to, uh, to live in same-sex uh, relationships, nor should we as, as a church uh, force people uh, we, we are in a situation where, uh, where people have to uh, make decisions about their own lives. But as, uh, as evangelical Christians, or I would say as Christians, um, we have an obligation to teach people what the word of God says and help people to, uh, to live if they want uh, in line with that teaching. And we need to give, uh, to give them support and stand with them. And we need to get rid of what has been deeply ingrained in many churches, this kind of contempt for people who are struggling with, uh, with issues like that. That is uh, deeply sinful. We should love each other, support each other, help each other. But we should also be... Uh, be honest with what is a biblical teaching. A church needs to draw a line in terms of who can have leadership uh, positions uh, and uh, maybe in terms of membership, depending on, on how your church is structured. But, but of course, a church needs to take a stand on this kind of issue. That, that's uh, that's um, uh, natural. And then we have to help each other to live with the pain it is to live in a fallen world where a number of things will not be fulfilling for us, but will be a struggle for us. That goes not only for this area, it goes for many other areas. Like I mentioned, you can find yourself in a troublesome marriage, which is not as fulfilling as you have dreamed of or hoped for, uh, but where you are called to, to follow Christ in a difficult situation. Thank you. Our next question is, is it wrong for couples who can have children to use contraception to prevent ever having children? Yeah, thank you. That is, of course, the view of the Roman Catholic Church that uh, contraception uh, per se is wrong. Uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, I think it's it's natural for for a, a couple that to include the possibility of of children. And uh, if it's not very specific or special circumstances, I think it's natural for a couple to sooner or later sometimes have children. That's part of of married life uh, normally. But I don't see any moral problems in using contraceptions as a way of taking responsibility of your marriage, of your time, uh, how it relates to studies and work and, and uh, uh, maybe periods of weakness or sickness for one of the, uh, of the spouses and so on. So that's, uh, in my view, a question about responsibility. What one needs to think through is what kind of uh, contraception uh, that uh, one uses because several uh, contraceptions uh, is actually a method for a very, very, very early abortion that, a, um, uh, that it uh, does not hinder the conception. Uh, so the conception takes place, but then, uh, then the egg is... Uh, is, it is not possible for the egg to, to stay. So I think uh, for a Christian, it's um, methods like, uh, uh, or uh, rather some of the pills have this abortion uh, function. So one needs to go th uh, to look through uh, that. Um, it's the same for, is it called in Swedish? It's spiral. Uh, I don't know what's in, it's in English. Okay, so a Christian needs to look through what's the function of the con contraception method. So it does not include a very, very early abortion. 
Great, thank you. This will have to be our last question for today. Um, we are going to go with the last question of, could a person, Christian or otherwise, be called a homosexual in the absence of sexual acts with others? In other words, is homosexuality defined by the behavior or defined by the inner feelings? Mm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so here is a, a, um, a new and quite a huge discussion about amongst Christians who experience same-sex attraction and they discuss what, how to, uh, how to um, label oneself. And uh, uh, could you talk about yourself as a gay Christian? Uh, uh, when you, uh, you live a celibate life, you do not uh, express your, uh, you do not live in a same-sex relationship. You do not express your sexuality in that, in that way, but you, you want to be honest that this, this is how I experience myself. Uh, now, in, in one way, I, 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 would, I would love to hear people for whom this is, is an actual, uh, actual issue to let them have a voice, and, and I would like to listen to them. Um, and um, and I, I, I would, happy, would be happy to do some more thinking. What I think at the moment is that I find it a little bit strange to put up your... your sexual identity into your the, the uh, on, on kind of top definition of who you are uh, I think it's much more natural to say who am I I'm a human being created by God and I'm a man because human beings are in two different versions so I'm a man I'm not a woman and then I would not go into let my different sexual interests or attractions to go into the definition of who I am. And of course I am a human being and I'm a, a man, a male, who has been drawn into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ and therefore I'm a Christian. And that is a, a, a decisive part of my identity. So I would go with that and then leave other aspects of who I am, positive things and things that are struggles and problems, I would leave that out from what I would like to have as my identity. Uh, and um, so, so that would be my, my answer. I think it's uh, maybe not that helpful to lift up things that are not decisive for who I am up into the description, my, uh, my kind of identity card. Uh, on that card, I would like to say, I'm a Christian uh, above all. <laughs>